From NJ.com and the Star Ledger, welcome to the Rutgers Rant, your one-stop podcast for the Scarlet Knights, with your hosts, Steve Politi and Rutgers insiders Brian Fonseca and Pat Lenny. Let's start shopping. All right, everybody, welcome back to the Rutgers Rant. Politi here, Fonseca Lanny, fresh off the big bowl announcement. We're going to talk a lot about that. We're going to talk Illinois Rutgers basketball. Not a great performance by the Scarlet Knights. Going to dive into the portal situation, which is turning out to go in, in Rutgers' direction so far. But let's talk about the matchup, guys. Rutgers-Miami. I mean, I think if you were to look at Pinstripe Bowl in September and say, all right, Rutgers is going to be in the Pinstripe Bowl, who would they play? I mean, Miami is just about as good as you could have hoped, I imagine, from a name recognition standpoint, from a you know the storyline standpoint for us certainly. But beyond that, Brian, I mean, like a winnable game now. I mean, Miami's no hot shakes. I'm just glad I woke up this morning and you guys weren't in the transfer portal and you guys are here on this podcast <laughs> oh, with me. That's so, so nice. I, tr- I tried. I tried going in. I didn't have the NIL I wanted. You won't be the first and you won't be the last. But I think absolutely this is like the best case scenario. Obviously, maybe you would like a better bowl, like a better destination. But if you're going to be in the pinstripe bowl playing an old biggies team, like you said, amazing storylines between Shiano and Crystal Ball and the old Big East thing. Rutgers has never beaten Miami, and aside from three quarters in 2002, never really came close. This is a revenge game for Rutgers that I think Rutgers fans won't care that Miami's on their third string quarterback. They won't care that you know a lot of their NFL prospects are going to opt out. All they care about is they'll finally beat one of those teams that just tortured them in the Big East. I'm not sure how many Miami fans will travel to this. Uh, so they, I think they don't travel to the games of Miami. So why would they possibly travel to the Bronx on December 28th? So near zero. Right. So that, that will be, you know, 80% Rutgers fans, 90% Rutgers fans. So I think it all sets up for a really good, fun, uh, exciting bowl for Rutgers. Pat, Greg Shannon had a great answer about the, the storylines and about starting his career in Miami at his press conference. And I think people forget just how young he was then. You know, he is a 30-year-old, 31-year-old guy on a team, Butch Davis. I mean, that those were some those were some of the greatest college football teams of all time. I mean, that's where he learned his that's where he learned this stuff. Think about that now in today's society <laughs> of coaching standards, right? Like Unbelievable. you're gonna yeah. hand over a national title potential defense to a 31 year old uh with very little experience that it's incredible it's really fascinating i i love that and it, it, i guess it just spoke to shiano's character and hard work and dedication that a program like miami could trust this up-and-comer you know and and it's, it's pretty fascinating you know obviously greg's had shiano's had a lot of success afterwards and and that kind of validates the position but yeah, it's really fascinating, and it's a great a great connection that the, the school jump started his career. Obviously, Crystal Ball was on that staff as well with Shiano at Miami in '99 and 2000 after he played at Miami. So, and then he jumped to Rutgers for three seasons as Shiano's offensive line and tight ends coach. So, just just chock full of connections in this game, and and I think that makes it really interesting. Obviously they're still great friends and there's loyalty between the two coaches. I think that makes this really interesting too. Just a lot of interesting storylines to to follow. Just to jump in on the coaching thing. I think another fascinating angle is like, I was looking this up this morning, Greg Schiano in 06 after their greatest season in program history, almost goes to Miami. He's a candidate for Mm -hmm. the job there, ultimately stays at Rutgers. And then when Schiano leaves Rutgers to go to the NFL, Mario Cristobal is one a for the job ultimately ends up turning it down. So just like the butterfly effect, what if in these two guys who are close friends, just such a fascinating situation here. I love to ask, and we'll try to ask Mario Cristobal about that turning down the job, because I I remember this vividly and it's kind of a funny story. I mean, I got onto a plane. I can't remember where I was going, but I remember getting onto a plane and it was a done deal. It's like, we're just, we're just finishing the contract. It's a done deal. Mario Cristobal's next coach. And like an idiot, I tweeted that. This is before like, you know, I, people recognized that Twitter was going to follow you for the rest of your life. I think it was like 2012. You could just throw you could just throw stuff on Twitter, and yeah, that looks like it's going to be Mario Cristobal. And I, we landed the plane, and it had fallen apart. There's no Wi-Fi on planes in 2012, of course. So we landed the plane, and it all fell apart. And I was like, "Well, yeah, it looked like a jackass." Thank God, no one. Thank God, no one looks at Twitter. Yeah, so it's still an old freezing take on uh, yeah, on that whatever that guy's name freezing takes. 
but yeah, I don't, I don't know what happened. There's rumors that his wife didn't want to come back here, but uh, maybe the money wasn't right. I, there's like a hundred things, and that that would have been, of course, the tip of the perfect Rutgers situation back then if they couldn't come up with a couple hundred thousand dollars to get the guy who's a rising star in profession, and then had to turn to Kyle J. Flood, who's just happened to be standing here. I mean, it, there's a lot of things that were going on back then. It's a different athletic department. 11 years ago, but yeah, it's a fascinating storyline that, you know, that in that guy's career, obviously twists and turns, you know, he, he turned out pretty well for him. I was looking at uh, photos from the 2011 pinstripe bowl press conference and there's Greg Schiano sitting next to Tim Pernetti. And you think <laughs> in that moment, if you're a Rutgers fan, you have like the best recruiting class of all time coming in. <laughs> Things must've been just so peachy at that point. And again, like, the what ifs are just, incredible uh it's it's been a 12 years it's been a decade since the last pinch right bowl and i'm i'm sure a lot of Rutgers fans are liking this conversation because they've probably had this thought you know a thousand times in their head over the past 10 years but it's gonna be something that's really fascinating for us to dig into over the next couple of weeks before this game they're looking at that pat they're like we'll never have to come here again with these two guys leading the way right that's that's what that must have been the thought in 2000 i'm sure i thought it too and uh what if kyle j flood is a part of a Texas national championship this year. Speaking of landing on his feet, I know, right? Good grief. Yes, that's amazing. It really yeah. is. It's great. And I'm happy for him. I mean, obviously, you know, not a bad guy, just didn't do a great job here um, at the end. Yeah, but he certainly, I mean, to, to think about that offense and the way it's playing, you've got to give him some credit for that. And he's the offensive coordinator. And I'm, that's not calling the plays, obviously, but still, I mean, that's just amazing. Yeah, this is sort of an, a fascinating for the Shiano coaching tree. Yeah. A fascinating couple months. Not not to derail this too much, but you think Kyle Flood has done enough? Yeah, rehabilitation between Alabama and Texas. If they win a natty, like he's got to be up for some head coaching jobs at some point, right? Yeah, I mean, you would think. I don't know what. So, what is that job? I guess is the question. Like, where, where, what would he take? What's the level that he could get, and how much? I mean, how much would the? I mean, people obviously look at what happened here, and I guess you can make. Believe me, after ten years, and not wrongly, like Kyle Flood could go into an interview and say, "Hey, look what I was dealing with, man. I got Julie Herman. I've got just the, the place is just an absolute mess. It took him ten. They're just now digging out of it. I mean, you, you can make you can make a case, certainly. And they, you know, then they'll ask about the Princeton sweatshirt. Maybe they'll laugh about it. Um, that whole deal. But you know, I mean. And not to mention the fact, just the sports change. Yeah, I, you know, he's a guy who, I don't know. He, he, there, there, are, you could see that certainly. Yeah, I don't, just don't know what level job. Pat, give me a job that Kyle get Jay Flood could get. Maybe like another up and come Virginia, uh, like like a, a low wow. a low level FBS. Uh, you know, power. He's five. not going to Wagner. It'd be a pay cut. Some like you know, right, like, can't go right. there. I, I would see like you know a, a revival type job. Right. Where he can say, I did a, uh, you know, I kept this, the ship steady for Rutgers for a while until it completely fell apart. I was a part of one of the biggest rebuilds in college football history. I think that's an attractive qu- characteristic mm-hmm. that he has on his resume. And uh, so I, I think it, it would be taking over a bad team trying to, but, but I also think he has a great job. Yeah. You no, know, currently, like, why would you want to leave that? So that's I, a I, good I, point. I, I, I wonder what he makes down there. Yeah, yeah, Texas and you know, going to the SEC, mm-hmm. things are good. If Texas football is good, I mean, what's a better job than that? Mm, that's a good point. All right. Now that we've broken down, uh, who knew coaching that was waiting? Head coach in waiting at Texas? Huh? No, oh, stop geez. it. Come here. Let me slap you across the computer here. Come <laughs> on. All right. So, yeah. So, matchup wise, let's just talk about the game. We're, we'll break it down. We've got three weeks to, to really do a preview here, but Miami's not coming. They don't have their starting quarterback. They've been hit with the portal pretty good, bad, I guess I should say, based on what I've seen. That's the kind of program where you wonder if guys, you know, they go in with higher expectations. Is this guy going to get up, get excited for the pinstripe bowl? I mean, they're one in seven in, in bowls since 2013. So, clearly, they're not excited for any postseason game. I mean, what do we expect from the Hurricanes? I looked at their like base numbers. They seem pretty good at everything. Not great, but pretty good. Balanced offense where they run pass half the time. But to your point, yeah, like I wonder how many of their best players are going to play between the NFL, between the portal, between opt outs. Like I'm, I'm. It's not very common, but I could see a guy that is one of their best players saying, "I'm not going to, I'm not going to sue for the pinch right." Well, why would I do that? And maybe it's like the North Carolina game in 2014 at the Quick Lane Bowl where. It looked like the, the Tar Heels were like, what am I doing in Detroit the day after Christmas? Like, what, 
what is the point of all this? And they got trucked by Rutgers. Because yeah. I think Rutgers, Greg Schiano will get this team up for this game. Rutgers has historically gotten up for bowl games. And I think they're easily going to win the motivation matchup. And the good yeah. players are going to play. I think I, even a Kyle Manung guy made it pretty clear. Like, oh, look, I, I don't know if I'm going pro or not, but I'm going to play the bowl game. I mean, I think that that's, that's the other part of this too. Yeah, certainly. Like Rutgers has a, a really good core of veteran leadership, and that's not going to go away for this game. Even if, like you said, with Manungai, he's one of those guys that is going to weigh his NFL future uh, against playing in the bowl game. But he he flat out said, "I'd be I'd be shocked if I didn't play." So, um, yeah, I, I just think Rutgers has that good core that it's been so long since they Gator Bowl. We get it, we get it. Uh, but it's been so long since they've had a, a real like we earned it bowl game. And I think this uh, this is a, a great example for a team to finish off that legacy. All right, let's uh, we'll have plenty of time to, to dive into the game. But let's talk the portal news right now. Um, best way I can say about the Rutgers portal news is that if there was a guy you thought would, uh, yeah, like Evan Simon, he's probably going to leave. He left. Like you know, Rashad Rochelle, he's probably going to leave. He left. That that's kind of been what's happened so far in the portal. There hasn't been a single one where you're like, oh wow. You know, and for the most part, all of the news has been good with Holland Pierce, Tyreen Powell, uh, Brian Felter. If I'm missing someone, jump in. But it seems like for the for the most part, if you were to make a list of the five guys they didn't want to lose in the, the portal, you're you're up to four now, right? Yeah, absolutely. First week has been really solid. Uh, I think there's still some names you're waiting for. I think Max Melton is one guy that everyone's pretty resigned to losing. It's probably his time anyway. I think yeah. it's the right decision for him to go. But the other guys, the toss-up guys, the 50-50 guys, it sounds like they'll come to a head this week. They got to figure it out soon enough, right? So um, I think Rutgers is on in a, in a good spot in both ends. With the portal, the, the losses they've had are not going to make or break next year's team. And I right. think the sense is that they're not in danger of losing anybody major. Obviously, that could change on a dime. It's the transfer portal. Ohio State their starting quarterback entered the portal this morning, although I'm not sure how hard Ryan Day worked to keep him. But the point being, as of now, I think Rutgers is in a good spot as far as retention. And they Mm got to hope that through the next 45 days, they can hang on for dear life, keep most of their best players. Um, And to your point, like a guy like Holland Pierce, if he went into the portal, he could probably make a good chunk of change as one of the better left tackles in the Big Ten. He came back, right? Tyreen Powell. He's probably NFL or staying either way, but if he entered the portal, Good chuck and change. Mm-hmm. Kyle guy and another guy like that. They got to hope they keep this momentum going and and, uh, and maintain these guys. All right, looking at the door the other direction, um, so far no that we know of. So far no guys coming in that we've seen, correct? I mean, there's not been any big announcement in that way. Uh, is there, Are there some out there that are close, do we think? Or is this going to take a little while to shake out? It's interesting because they got a little bit of a head start on those Ivy League guys that that's true, yeah. That uh, you know, didn't have to follow the the path of Power Five people because uh, the rules are different for the Ivy League and Patriot League. Um, so I think Rutgers got a pretty nice head start on guys that are local guys that seem like they want to make that next step to show that they can play at in the Big Ten to parlay that into an NFL career. So I think that's a an attractive recruiting pitch for Rutgers to sell to guys like that. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they got a little bit closer with some of those Ivy league players they offered over the last couple of days. And then, uh, yeah, I just think when you go back to it, the defections from Rutgers are all guys that weren't getting playing time and you can understand why they're leaving, right? Like Evan Simon, Max Patterson, those are guys that were just buried on the depth chart. So they're Mm -hmm. looking for an opportunity to get on the field. Uh, It hasn't been about money. It hasn't been about, you, you know, we're not fond of this coaching staff. It's just they haven't been playing. And Rashad Rochelle, they're just looking for an opportunity to get on the field. And that's totally understandable, in my opinion. Right, right. Uh, the other direction, this is everyone's everyone's asking, all right, so Rutgers going to get a quarterback, get a quarterback, get a quarterback in the portal. It's just the constant thing that we've we've been asking ourselves. We the, Obviously, a major storyline. And I was thinking about this. And um, covering, it really is like covering NFL free agency without any of the information. That's the best way I can describe it, what we're doing here. Because when we cover, like we, co- I've covered the NFL free agent with a quarterback and the Giants need a quarterback. Okay, you look at who they've got on the roster. You look at where they're going to draft. Uh, you look at who's available in the draft or who likely will be available. You look at who's available in free agency, coming on contracts, how much money they've got in the salary cap. And you can narrow the list down too. Like, well, they could probably get this guy, this guy, this guy's not a good fit. They should wait till next year. It's like, it's like a really simple 
exercise with college football. We have no idea. And it's really funny because like, we have no idea. Kyle McCord's in the portal. My first reaction was, well, that's crazy. He's going to make a lot of money. Then I'm like, well, maybe Ohio State kicked him out because they're going to get a better quarterback. But he's still going to make like, – we have no idea what these guys are making. We don't know what the – we don't know how much money Rutgers can spend. We don't know how much they're going to command. We don't know other offers. It, it, it's just like – Guys, I'm out. Like, I don't want to say it's helpless because we're not, you know, we're not digging ditches in the rain for a living. But it's 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 really like, I, I don't know, hard, right? And in the NFL, guys are they have contracts. They can't just decide, oh, they're bringing in a new quarterback. Let me just transfer out of here, right? Right. So that's another delicate balance that college coaches have to deal with that NFL guys don't. Matt Rule put a figure out there last week. The Nebraska coach said something that a good quarterback is between a million, one and a half, two million dollars. Uh, you got to think a guy like Sam Hartman last year, right. probably the best prospect on the market quarterback wise, probably got something like two million at Notre Dame. You got to think the top guys, the, whoever Ohio State's going to get, has to command some kind of money like that, right? Because that was one of the main things missing for Ohio State to beat Michigan, and they really want to beat Michigan, and they were willing to spend a lot of money to beat Michigan. When it comes to Rutgers, again, we we keep talking about this, but they're in a tough spot because they don't have enough money to compete in this very robust market. They already have a guy they feel good about who has a lot of years of um, of uh, eligibility left. And if they're going to get a quarterback, they have to get a quarterback that's better than Gavin Wimsett. They don't have enough money to get a quarterback they know is better than Gavin Wimsett. Is it worth spending some of your limited NIL at a position that is in a better spot? Some will argue against this, but in a better spot than a lot of your other positions like wide receiver, tight end, etc.? Don't you think? And I'm gonna since we spent about uh, half the podcast fighting about this last week. Don't you think though that part if they if they can't get obviously not going to McCord if they if they're not comfortable if they can't even afford an EJ Warner. Don't you think that they have to get a quarterback who can provide competition for Gavin Wimsett? Like that's the other part of this. Not just the guy. Well, he's better than Gavin. He's going to come and start. I don't think that's as necessary as having somebody else in the room who can press him during training camp or it's going to be a position where you know i mean look behind the back like the backups to aaron Rodgers for the jets we've got, we've got three guys who we can't can't complete a pass in college football i mean uh, you know isn't, isn't that part of it as well just finding that person again that's fiano's biggest thing too that he says all the time right like the cream rises to the top yeah uh-huh. it's one of his favorite coaching lines so that is exactly the kind of developmental program that he wants and the competition that he wants to inspire and develop talent. Uh, so, yeah, I totally agree with you that that competition is is definitely necessary and coveted for this program. What, what I would say against that is let's play out that scenario. Let's say they get a middle of the pack, you know, Mac quarterback, like a guy who's good enough to compete with Gavin Wimsett, but you're not sure he's going to be a better quarterback than Gavin Wimsett. Let's say Gavin Wimsett says, competition, I'm the starter. Why are you bringing in competition? I'm out of here. And he leaves. And now you're stuck with a middling, oh, unproven I... quarterback, a true freshman, and a redshirt freshman. What do you do then? You you say, you wave. And honestly, you wave goodbye. Because then, he, then he's not, if you're not confident enough, if you can't look at Gavin Wimsett, you mean to think you can't beat, the, you think you don't think you can beat this guy? Like every other position, like, you know, how about you know, how about a linebacker? We got guys. That, how about you know, quarterback? How about every other position in the team? We've got guys competing for jobs. You don't. You're not confident enough in yourself to beat out blank. It's not, you're not bringing in Kyle McCord, and then I right, bring in Kyle McCord. You transfer, but if you're bringing in the, you know, the Akron quarterback, I don't know. I mean, I just I think that that would be a really bad uh, bad look for Gavin Wimsett. And believe me, we're just hype. We we have no idea he's going to do that. This is just a hypothetical it's conversation. Hypothetical. And, and again. How much better is the Mac quarterback from Akron than Evan Simon? Oh. We're gonna have the same situation next year. It would be the same exact thing as last year, except you yeah, you lost Evan Simon. <laughs> you're not replacing it. Are they gonna replace Evan Simon? That's what you're proposing. Well, they don't have, but I know exactly. But they had so their quarterback room was better last year than this year. Is what I'm saying right now. My you're point replace is, it. Evan Simon did not play last year, aside from three passes when Gavin was knocked out of a game. Right. I would assume if they get the Akron quarterback, I don't even know his name. This poor kid's getting dragged through the mud on this podcast. If they get the Akron quarterback and he doesn't play, that's wasting a roster spot. When you could have a kid like AJ Serres, who you view as the future of the position in your program, he's the backup. He has the incentive of, I can make it into a game at any point. Sure. I'm competing for the job. 
would it not be more valuable to give your up and coming true freshman the realistic opportunity to compete for the job than to grab some middling guy who's going to be an accountant in three years think, to yeah. competition? A good program doesn't start the Notre Dame prep quarterback at 18 years old in September. I mean, just that doesn't. That doesn't happen. I mean, yeah. I don't. I mean, talk about I'm not saying how good he is. We're talking about competition. <clears throat> of course, right? He will yes. compete for the starting job. He will. This right. job that this mythical Mac quarterback would do of pushing Gavin Wimsett, AJ Sirace can do that. And the double part is that instead of him being here it. for a year leaving, he can do that and develop and be and accelerate his process to becoming the guy in the future. Yeah. Just, just for the record, real quick, the one of the two quarterbacks at Akron is uh, a former St. Peter's prep quarterback. Wow, about Bullock. Mm. Mm. Was a was a big prospect in high school and ended up at Virginia Tech, then went to Akron. So this is going to be great if it happens. If it happens, like, hey, those guys in the those guys at the Rutgers rent knew about the Akron quarterback like months before. It could be great, hilarious. Yeah, well, of course we did. We know, of course, of course. Of course. Bullock. Bullock. I saw him play ten games in high school. Excellent, exactly. exactly, man. So, We're going to spend right. three hours of podcast time talking about a position that is not going to change one iota. <laughs> We're going to walk into spring camp with the same three guys we expect, and we wasted all this time. But mm. if they do get the Akron quarterback, it would be very funny. I'll, I'll bet you one crisp American, Bill, from a movie you certainly didn't see, Trading Places. One crisp American. Dollar. Have you seen the movie, Eddie Murphy? No? Anyway. They'll bring in the, they're going to bring in the quarterback. That's my prediction. No information here. Absolutely. You're probably right, but I'm sticking with it because it's, it's the opinion, and why back down now? All right, you want to do some true or false? Let's do some true or false. Let's do it. Let's move on. A lot of national true or false stuff in here just because it was really a big day for, for true or false. Okay. Uh, true or false, the playoff committee got it right. Pat, are we on team playoff committee? Absolutely not. <laughs> so false. I hope we'll revisit that. <laughs> uh, well, we're going to talk about it right now, Brian. I would say if... Getting it right means putting the best matchup for me to watch on New Year's Day on my couch? Absolutely. If getting it right means putting the team that deserves to be there and that is best for the health of college football? Absolutely not. Florida State got hosed. They got Mawat magged. Their best player got hurt, and they got punished for that. Um, Rutgers was a little different situation because they played 11 games. Florida State played two games, one game with their third-string quarterback, who is 18 years old, and they beat Louisville because their defense is unreal. But we got to put in Alabama because the poor old SEC, they can't be out of the playoff. It's a shame. No, they can't. They can't be out of the playoff because right now a a Alabama is is easily the second best team. Forget the fourth best team. So, yeah, I think the playoff committee, if you're going to make it, I think the playoff committee absolutely got it right. And, I, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, FSU got screwed. FSU got absolutely. Someone was going to get screwed. And it, it, you might as well screw the team that's not going to win the – FSU is not going to win the national championship with that with, with their back and quarter. It's not. So get the four best teams. That's the entire point of it. And if you're going to make an argument, anybody really got screwed. It's Georgia because they are the best. They are the, easily the second best team right now. If you were to look at it objectively – they, on paper, you would pick Georgia over just about anybody, but but forget. They, of course, they don't get they don't get in. I get that totally. They lost to Alabama, and that was a play. That was essentially a playoff game. But man, I'm sorry. I just I have no sympathy. I have sympathy, but I've got no you know go cry me a river, Florida State. You just it, it happens. Life isn't fair. Why play the games? Why play yeah. the games? Well, they did play the games, and the quarterback got hurt. I mean, that's just ridiculous. I mean, what can I tell you? You're saying okay. Alabama is good now. They're the second best team now. What about three months ago when they were – they stunk. They lost to Texas. They almost lost to South Florida. They almost – last week they almost lost to Auburn. They, they, they needed a they did. That is true. Oh, that's, that's true. They lost that's to Jerry time. Kill at home by three touchdowns. But, again, they're not playing. But they're that team won the – you're not playing with – it's just not. I mean, you could, what's, what's the line? What would the line be? Alabama, Michigan, Florida State. What would that be? All right, let's let's let seventeen Vegas points. Pick, let's let Vegas that's, pick the top. That's four. another hypothetical. Like, why do we live in this hypothetical world when you? There's only four when, teams. That's why we live in the hypothetical okay. world. You, you can say that all you want. Like, it just goes back to like, why do you even do rank? Why did you rank Florida State all season long and last week? If you knew this was the case, because they had a Heisman Trophy candidate for all season long, and then not the guys week. hurt. Not last week. <laughs> they were still in. They were still in, and then the, what did they do? They went out and won. They went out and won, and you drop Christ them for dude. winning. Oh, in what man. world do you drop a team for winning? That's wow. ridiculous. That goes against like philosophy of rankings. 
Here's the other part of this. Yeah, I hear you. Here's the other part of this, and this is this is the second true or false that plays into this. True or false? The ACC is in its death throes. Pat, is this a sign that the ACC are, is absolutely complete? look at the four teams they picked? <laughs> There's a reason they're the new mm-hmm. super conferences got all four teams. Yeah, pretty much, Brian. Florida State is going to do. I think they have a campus in Saudi Arabia or Qatar or something, some Middle Eastern power. They're going to talk to Mohammed bin Salam, say, "Give me a hundred million dollars and build my own super conference." And in five years, Florida State will be the founder and CEO of the college football super league. Florida State, Ohio State, Alabama, Georgia play each other four times a year, every year, and then at the end of the year, the the one with most wins wins the national championship, and all those fans can enjoy that. And then the rest of us could enjoy actual college football. Yeah, Florida State wouldn't get picked for that. Um, yeah. It, so to your point, ACC, I think this is really this is this is the ultimate sign here. And I people I get it. The people on the committee might not have done this consciously, but certainly subconsciously. I think there's in the back of their mind that well, we can't we can't screw the SEC. I think that's totally what happened. And meanwhile, the ACC is like, eh, you know, and it's just it's it's an afterthought. All right, uh, next, true or false? True or false, Kyle McCord is entering the portal to come home to Rutgers. I put this in there before we discussed it. Pat, give me any chance. Well, give, me a, give me a number. Don't give me a true or false. Give me a percent that, that, we, that we'd have Kyle McCord here for his father's uh, team. It's not really home when for him. Brian but. talked to his dad. They spoke so highly of Rutgers, obviously. So it's, mm-hmm. not, it's not zero. I'm going to say five. Five percent. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Brian, you're going to say zero, aren't you? No, look, I think Derek McCord respects Rutgers and Greg Schiano. I do think that when they took the call from Greg, when he got hired again at Rutgers, I mean, they never really considered Rutgers because they were committed to Ohio State for eight months. But I do think there's that connection there. So that gives them two and a half percent. Okay, that's good. I'll, I'll go. I'll take the under. But I think that's at least a you're, you're telling me there's a chance. So we'll go with that. All right. True or false? The basketball team will win three of its next four games. As a reminder, Pat, we've got at Wake, at Seton Hall, LIU, and Mississippi State at The Rock. Three of the next four. True or false? Thanks for the reminder. Uh, we're going to go, <laughs> go with true on this one. Really? All uh, right. Brian, true or false? I am stunned. I'm stunned. I love it. True I will say uh, completely false. Okay. So true or false? The Hoops team will win two of its next four games. Oh, I didn't say. I said false that. I will say false that as well after what I saw against Illinois. Um, Brian, two of the next four. That's like, that's what they need to do. That's the realistic. Uh, I'll say false. Three of them are away from, wow. three of them are away from Piscataway. They have lost 10 straight regular season non-conference games outside of home Ooh. against teams like St. Bonaventure, like Temple, they're not playing, you know, Duke every in all those games. They're, I, I just and especially and those were good Rutgers teams. I'm not sure this is a good Rutgers team. Wake Forest is good. Mississippi State is good. Seton Hall is not bad. Um, I think it's more likely they lose all three than they win two of the three. Wow. Okay, I'm going to say true. They will win two of the next four. I uh, just don't see it. To the, I don't see that to the level that you do. The concern there about the uh, the opponent, and the next one would be true or false. They're in big trouble. So obviously, you're saying true to that, Brian. If you want to, if you want to take it, if they lose the next three, what's what is the situation then? If we if we get to that point, sure. And to be clear, two of the next three against those those road games, right? Yeah, they're, they're going to beat Long Island University. That would be an absolute disaster. But they've been pretty good at beating bad teams, so I, I'm not worried about that. If they lose the next three, their NCAA tournament hopes are essentially kaput. It's essentially done. The Big Ten is down this year, so there's not a lot of chances to get big wins in conference to make up for a bad non-conference like they did a couple years ago. They need some signature win. They need to prove they can win away from home. I think winning at Wake would be huge. That's their one true road game. I guess Seton Hall as well, but that's a rivalry game. That's in-state. It's not going very far. Uh, Mississippi State would be big. That's their best non-conference opponent. Mississippi State lost at home to Southern yesterday who's 308th on Ken Palm, so they're not invincible, and they're down their best player. My worry is not on the opponents. My worry is what I saw from Rutgers against Illinois, what I've seen from them all season. I don't think their backcourt is good enough to win games. I don't think Cliff Omori has taken the step forward that he needed to to be the number one option on a team. I think they are decent defensively. I think they do well in the press. That helps them a lot. I don't think this team is good enough defensively 
to carry them to wins with the way they play offensively. It's just, it's just not there. Yeah. Those two things you mentioned just, and I, again, the rebounding thing, I, I called it astounding on Twitter. That might be an exaggeration, but I mean, some of the stats you threw out there about, you know, 19 offensive rebounds versus what was it 18 defensive rebounds for records. I mean, some of the stuff was just like, I just, I'm just that to me, since that's been the identity of this program under Steve Peichel for it to be that bad. Again, the Illinois could be really good. They're in, they're going to make the tournament. They're, they, they're impressive still. I mean, they're not, you know, they're not some, they're not the, I don't know. They're not Kansas, not UConn. I was just really surprised by that. And the cliff thing to me is also just, I've just watched it and we have high expectations for him. Granted he had whatever, seven blocks or whatever he had in the game. Um, so he played well defensively, but he just seems like he's out of position in rebounding. Now I just, he doesn't seem like he's playing with guys. It's just, it, it's just something missing. And I don't know. There's, and then when he gets the ball around the basket, you're like, you know, it, it's just, why has that not gotten better? I just don't understand, man. Every time he throws up a a little soft shot, it's just off by a couple of feet. I, I, that to me is is really I'm really surprised by that. That is the biggest surprise so far, right? Like the all expectations were this was going to be Cliff's team. That's why he's back, right? Like he, it's finally his time to shine, and he's regressed a little bit. I just think like Rutgers can't start any worse than they started against Illinois right so I'm, I'm going to take this game a little bit and, and put it in a put it into perspective right like it was over right out of the gate they kept climbing back whatever but they dug themselves such a hole that everything mm-hmm. else fell apart they shot the ball terribly I don't think they'll shoot the ball that poorly going forward although they're not a great shooting team but still like it's just uh I'm chalking it up to just a really bad performance and uncharacteristic, like you said, with the rebounding and things. I, I think the next couple of games are it's either prove it or forget about it. So it's time to step up to the plate. Brian, were you surprised that Bawai Mag didn't play in that game? No, I think Steve Peichel has indicated frequently in the last couple of weeks that he's cleared to play. Like he's physically cleared by the doctors to play, but it's up to Mawat to decide he's comfortable enough to take the take the court and play after the torn ACL. It happened ten months ago, which I know their timelines are accelerated nowadays, mm-hmm. but it's still to put it into perspective, it hasn't been a year. Um, I can totally understand the kid being nervous to, and especially I thought it was possible if he played against St. Peter's, get his feet wet, then transition to Illinois, but to go from that to playing one of the better teams in the Big Ten, the way they press uh, defensively, Rutgers does, and the way the, the intensity you'd have to play with out of the gate, probably have to guard Terrence Shannon Jr., who's a first-team All-Big Ten guy. I just think it makes sense that he'd not want to go in immediately. And now my question now is, like, when does he come back? Is this a thing where you wait till January? I think the early expectation before he kind of was ahead of his rehab was January is the earliest he'll come back for Big Ten play. Maybe that's back on track. Maybe, I don't know. I mean, if they get to the middle of January, he's not back yet, and it's a lost season. Is it worth taking the court? Does he take a red shirt year? Like, I am i don't know this for a fact. I'm kind of just talking out loud here. But mm-hmm. I think at this point, since he's not back yet, all options are really on the table. And they clearly miss him more so defensively. Uh, they're really good defensively. They could be even better if Mawat Mag is out there. Again, he would have been really helpful against a guy like Terrence Shannon. Uh, he'd be better offensively. I mean, they don't have many offensive options and he was coming on as an offensive option last year. It's an interesting situation to follow. I think Steve Peichel is showing a little bit of frustration uh, in when he's answering this question. One, because he keeps getting asked it. And two, um, just kind of, I think back in 1990 when he was playing, Milwaukee Mag would be playing. Steve Peichel played a lot of games with a, 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 you know, a bum shoulder and he he's, he's a guy from that era where you tough it out. And I'm not saying it's right or wrong, it's just very clearly a different day nowadays. And Mawat Mag, completely understandably, is not quite ready. And one thing I want to go back to from what you guys said, I'm not really surprised Cliff Omori hasn't developed offensively as far as around the rim. He struggled with his touch his entire career. It's been one of his Achilles heels. I think he had a chance to be a little bit better, but I mean, he's clearly not developed his post moves, uh, which again, that's not a big deal for his NBA aspirations, but that's something that a lot of the good bigs in the Big Ten do. That's what Zach Eady does. That's what a guy like Kofi Coburn used to be able to do. And I think you need a big to be able to do that. Uh, Cliff hasn't been able to do that. I don't know if they're going to be able to transition him into a guy that does pick and rolls, rolls to the rim, kind of a Clint Capella guy who rebounds, defends, and that's his offense. That's probably the best role for him. I don't know if they have, A, the ball handlers that can create for him to be able to do that. And I'm not sure 
you can just change the offense on a dime like this in, in December. So uh, I call it the Cliff Omori conundrum. I think that's kind of where they're at. And I do think that this is a season that might drag on a bit once we get to January and the NIT will end up being the goal once it becomes bubble time. The other, so the other part of this, Brian, and I, 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 I watched that game and, the one thing I've, I've, I guess we've taken for granted over the last few years because we've, we've, we've had guys in the program who've been there forever, who you know what they're going to do, then you know their roles. I'm really having a hard time, and I think Steve Peichel is too, just figuring out what roles different guys have. And and I, I just like now Austin Williams looked like he was a guy who should play more, but clearly he didn't. He, he wasn't that way early on. You know, I guilt. I certainly think Gavin Griffiths should play more. Twenty-two minutes a game. I get it. If you can't play defense, I understand why he's not out there. But man, I just you know he's the future. Give him the minutes. You know, one game is Fernandes, the next game it's Davis taking the big shots. It just seems like there's just a lot of still this team figuring out that part of the game. I think there's a lack of a bona fide leader. I think Rutgers has gotten used to having a guy like Geo Baker, a guy like Ron Harper, a guy who you know is A, going to have the ball in his hands, B, is going to be the focal point on offense. And obviously with Cliff being their best player, that kind of shifts it a little bit. But I think Noah Fernandes, Austin Williams, Derek Simpson, no one's really taking the reins. I think Noah Fernandes is the prime point guard, but he's not a guy that can just create off the dribble and and make plays and shoot. And uh, I think Derek Simpson's the guy they hope that can be that offensive guy, can drive to the rim, can shoot. He's struggling really hard, struggling very much to shoot for twos. His three per, point percentage is really good, but he only shoots about one or two a game. So that's not very helpful. Uh, they need a guy to emerge. Austin Williams looked really good for that four minute stretch in the first half where they kind of came back against Illinois. Uh, so that's in- encouraging, but he really disappeared the rest of the game after he got benched from that. So um there's no consistent guy. That's probably what they need. And look, they're in a tough spot because, I mean, no, Fernandes, they got early in the portal, but Austin Williams is the guy they got in July, like because yeah. Paul McKay and Cam Spencer left. That the situation is what it is. We don't have to rehash that, but they kind of were put in a tough spot with that. And this is just kind of what they have to do. I think Austin Williams is also working back from a knee injury. So maybe there's another gear there that he doesn't have, but uh, he's 25 years old. This is what he is. Uh, right. And I, th- I just think that. I, I don't think the ceiling for this team can get much higher. I do think there is a chance the floor gets a little higher. That's what they got to hope for. Uh, and again, we've said this, the, the telling thing will be these three games. If they can compete against Lake Forest, if they can compete against Seton Hall, if they can compete against Mississippi State, steal a win would be big. I think that would be encouraging. And Steve Peichel teams in the past have gotten better as the season's gone on. They've had good Januaries, good Februaries that's kind of what you got to hold on to and hope that happens this year. Pat, as an op, you're the optimistic one here. What, what gives you optimism? It's just uh, based on past experience that every time you count this team out, they find a way to like buckle down, find something new, redevelop, rebrand themselves. So I think a lot of it has to do with physicality and and a game by game basis. And that was obviously lacking against Illinois. They were completely dominated from a physical standpoint, but you got to hope that, that will figure they'll figure it out in the next couple of games. And it's more based on what has happened in the past. That gives me that, like you said, they're still trying to figure it out. Maybe they will. That's the optimism. All right. Good job. That's your basketball stuff. We'll obviously talk a lot more hoops in the coming weeks. Uh, let's do some questions from our insiders. NGA.com slash Rutgers insider to join. Um, lots of, portal questions here not a surprise uh but a few interesting just big picture questions and this one just about uh, facilities versus nil five to ten years ago it was facilities race when it came to football programs today to me nil rules the campuses what's more important to rutgers now new field house or nil pool um i think greg shannon himself would tell you it's the nil pool uh the problem is that unlike all these other programs that built their their death star 10 years ago Rutgers still doesn't have that. So like, I just like I wonder, is there still room to build? Do they still have to build something just to have a competent facility or does that not matter at all? That That's the interesting question with, because and it, the answer is NIL pool, right? NIL is the most important thing in college football today it is the lifeblood of programs. It's the only way you're going to get top end players. And the only way you could win in college football is to have top end players. Right. I do think there should still be an emphasis on, the practice facility. I think that Rutgers facility, their outdoor facility is gorgeous. 
It's good. Barco Battaglia practice complex, complex is good for what it is, but they need a better indoor practice facility for when they have to practice in ugly days in the spring or late, you know, like in December when they practice for these bowl games at home and it's, let's say it starts snowing, you need somewhere to practice indoors. The bubble is still at a point where if it snows too much, it collapses, right? So you can't have that as your primary indoor practice facility. Uh, I think that's the battle here at Rutgers, a place that does not have a ton of donors, a lot of money to be to be made, right? So you got to kind of split the pool. I think Greg Schiano will prioritize NIL more than anything. But I think that as much as we've talked about this practice facility for, it feels like 10 years, like how long have they been talking about this yeah. practice facility? No, I at some point, you got to build it. Before you were born. Yeah. Very possible. Uh, and that's it's almost, that's like, it's a, just basically, that's, you think that's an, uh, an exaggeration. I'm not sure it is. Pat, to the NIL problem is that it's not just, Greg Shannon speaks about it like it is really a desperate situation. And he had another quote, um, again, like about the incoming portal. And he, he never misses an opportunity to kind of just slip one of these in here. But this was, if you were listening to this press conference, I, wrote, I typed it up. There are some guys that you look up on tape and say, yeah, we'd love to be involved with that with him, but it's going to be X number of dollars and we don't have it. Right. Like, so right. this is both managing expectations right. yeah. and shooting and a flare. Then he, and then he added to that, like, we're going to, maybe we should uh, rally the troops is what he said for another, for, for a position that we actually need is, is kind of what he added to that. And right. I thought that was very revealing too. Uh yeah, it was a great quote because I pictured him, <laughs> pictured him like picking up the red phone, like we got a we got a receiver here that we can get. Flash the bat signal over the skies of Middlesex County, like it's, you know, it's John shocking. Newman's going to come running in with a cape on. Someone please draw me a cartoon of this it's coming great. out of nowhere to save That's the day. Great. Yeah, yeah. Instead of Shiano on horseback, it'll be Shiano with a shopping cart. That's perfect. Uh, it's it's <laughs> it's almost like going to the going to the mall like are you going to shop in the luxury wing at uh you know uh whatever Saks Fifth Avenue or are you going to go to Old Navy and it just seems like <laughs> we're at the Goodwill store here come on <laughs> yeah, sure. but it seems like they know what they need that they can go and get a pair of jeans at Old Navy that's going to suit them well as, as as opposed to just putting yourself in, in a position to go into debt or whatever uh, shopping in stores that are out of your price range. So it's really fascinating. And just to go back to the facilities versus NIL pool, I think you guys are completely right about that. And when you, but when you, one of the, uh, another big picture issue with this whole transfer portal and thing is like, what has become of recruiting high school players and developing them? If you're going to be, refilling the pipeline with experienced players year in and year out like what's the point of recruiting these high school players that are never going to get on the field i think that's a conundrum and and a, a philosophical standpoint that college programs have to kind of figure out uh because Rutgers has some young players that may just never get on the field and you're starting to see those defections and i think that's a problem too for a quote-unquote developmental program i think the the thing with the, the, the idea they have is like to be a developmental program, get some high school kids, develop them. Sometimes the pipeline gets burst. Like look back at the 2021 recruiting class, which is part of what Max Patterson was. He just left. Um, look at how many of them panned out. It's not many. So when something like that happens, recruiting misses, guys don't develop, et cetera. The portal is kind of like a, a bandaid for the the leak yeah. in the, in the pipeline. Right. Uh, but I agree with your point. I think programs are, saving 10, 15 scholarships a cycle for transfer kids that would have normally gone to high school kids. So there's a lot of kids that are missing opportunities and uh, it, it sucks, but that's kind of just the way the um, modern day college football goes. Oh, absolutely. A lot of those a lot of those players who are in the portal are not there because they want it to be in the portal. I mean, we got to remember that this is roster management. This is, you know, there are some conversations that are happening, not just at Rutgers, across college football, where it's like, all right, we're, you know, you haven't earned a starting job yet, but you've been here two years yeah, time time to go, and that's just kind of where we're at. I mean, it's crazy, but that's yeah. Welcome to college football, twenty twenty three. Uh, all right, we had a bunch of quite couple of questions about Kyle Manungai. If there's any latest on him and playing in the bowl, and I'll just tie that in, Pat, with a question about Sam Brown. Uh, is he still recovering from his injury, or did something happen in the scheme this year that didn't do him any favors? Um, they seem related, those two. It's a fascinating question, and I, I think. It's just a product of Manungai's emergence. I've always viewed Sam Brown as a 
repetition player that gets better with carries similarly to Manunga, that like in the fourth quarter, he's wearing down defenses. And I just don't think he got the opportunity to see that with the limited carries he had. I think early in the season, health was a major concern and he was definitely not practicing at full capacity, took some time to get back into shape. So that certainly allowed Manunga to really grasp hold of the backfield. And then it just became, how are you going to take the ball away from the guy that's the best player on the team? So they are linked. As for the latest with Manungai, I'm not sure that anything's changed. I think he's still waiting to figure it out, but I think he's still full go for at least going to play in the bowl game, and then we'll, we'll go from there. All right, we got a question. This is this is a funny one. I, honestly, I, I wasn't going to include it, but then – all right, so is, is it true Tim Riggins has entered the portal and has Rutgers on his list? Now, I don't know if this person – if there is a Tim Riggins or one of our texters is just making a really good joke about Tim Riggins from Friday Night Lights, the TV show, if you ever watched that. If you haven't watched that, I know it was a couple of few years ago, guys. If you haven't watched it, find whatever it's on and just watch it. Great show. But Tim Tim Riggins is in the trend. If if it is the tw- Tim Riggins from that show and he's in the transfer portal, I hope Rutgers gets him on his list because he was a fantastic player uh, and a leadership guy too. Tim Riggins. Is there another Tim Riggins? This feels like a Mike Francesa joke where like they just try to get you to. It does feel like it, that, but that, of course, we can just keep on going. Heard that name before. We can keep on going. Yeah. Uh, what was this? you got? You got on the air. Good job. That uh, <laughs> like the cat will have a good Francesa impersonation. Is there a Tim Riggins, Brian? I always liked Tim Riggins. I thought he was I a good player. Play. Uh, well, uh, the, 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 no, I don't the think Rutgers there is Tim level. Riggins. Could I, it be at the Rutgers level? Is he? Yeah. I mean, the quarter when the quarterback got hurt, Tim Riggins was the guy you tr- you came in there, trusted him. No, Which there's no Tim Riggins. Did you guys watch Friday Night Lights? I did not. No. Oh, I watched the movie. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I would just yeah. You, the show is the first season of the show is fantastic. Just trust me on something for once. I finished Sex in the City, so maybe uh, maybe I'll put that next Sex time. in the City. Really? Oh my! Oh. Goodness. It's just I mean I'm a little surprised. What do we think of Sex in the City? David, is it does it rise up to the level? Is it you watch the from the beginning like the old Sex in the Cities or just the new Sex is Sex I in the City here? I, I haven't watched the new version that just came out. I watched yeah. the the OG original. You did. I think uh, I think it's a fun show with complicated characters. I very much liked Carrie's arc. wasn't a big fan of how it ended, but uh, I, I can relate to all of them to some extent. Uh, I, would, I think I'm a Miranda, but we can debate that off the pod because we can talk about this for two hours. So I don't know that I've got two hours. I don't know if I can do two hours in Sex in the City. Pat, you strike me as um, a Miranda as well. Yeah, I, I don't know what that means. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's move on okay i'm not sure what that means either uh, okay this is this is a fun one greg from pa i love questions like this love questions like this i was debating this with my friends last night if the pre-defection big east was still intact miami virginia tech bc syracuse Pitt, west virginia Rutgers temple i think there's a pretty high probability that Rutgers wins the conference outright this year here's this let me them greg let's look greg run for a minute here Rutgers beat Virginia Tech, Tech beat Pitt, beat Q's and BC. One common opponent between Virginia, West Virginia and Rutgers was Penn State. Penn State won both, but blew uh, blew out West Virginia and it was a bit out. Anyway, he goes on and on and on. Anyway, this, this is a good offseason debate. Would Rutgers have won the Big East? Rutgers should never win the Big East. <laughs> well, they yeah. lost to West Virginia in this hypothetical situation, right? Like <laughs> everything would have been like ten and zero. West Virginia would have been like three losses, and something crazy would have happened. I think that's <laughs> exactly. hypothetical. What do you think when you think back to the old Big East? That's the reality. <laughs> <laughs> the number of times I wrote that column, my God, when are they going? I mean, some of them just became almost pleading about Rutgers versus West Virginia when they lost those games year after year. And I mean, obviously uh, Greg Shannon was 0 for 11. Um, so yeah, I was kind of hoping that would be the bowl matchup. That would be fun. I do think uh, Miami, West Virginia, much like the old Big East, Big East days would be 1A, 1B. I think Rutgers would be probably top of the second tier. Um, I know we think Rutgers could beat Miami in the pinstripe bowl, but they had a much better quarterback and more NFL talent than Rutgers had this year. Um, and West Virginia is West Virginia. West Virginia could be 0 and 11. I don't think Rutgers will be able to beat them. So, and this is the great one. I'm going to throw this out too. This, this is another Miami old school 
Rutgers of Miami thing from one of the texters. It just cracked me up. And I hope if you do remember this, that you guys will text us and explain your memories of this. But the question was, was, do you remember the Miami game when they just had opened the new student section at Rutgers and the students broke the fencing and tumbled onto the field and the crowd was chanting, kill the duck. And that there was one stuffy old guy yelling, it's an Ibis. So for one, I would like to see more of that. Now, I don't remember this at all. I have no recollection of this. I I want it to be true that there is that there were fans fans clamoring for the Miami Duck. You know, I think that's only yeah. I would love to be if please, folks. If you remember this, this might be a good oral history for one of the two you to write during the holidays. I'm just throwing it out there. That's just a great if that really happened. I don't. I, know. I don't want to get the kid that fell through, fell off the rail, fell through the railing. It was in this pile of bodies. That that would be fascinating. What is what does the ibis rank for you guys? Is the ibis like a, a high quality mascot, or is it is it a lower tier mascot? Obviously, it's up there because puddles at Oregon is is top of the list. And if you're going to go with like, I guess it's not a duck. We're, we're <laughs> apparently I, an ibis. <laughs> what is an ibis? What is an ibis? It's another it's like a waterfowl. <laughs> Perfect. I love it. I think it's great. I love the U. I think everything they got, the color scheme is great. The attitude, the mascot, love it all. I always thought he was a pelican. You thought he was? He wasn't. Now pelican's got the big, the big nose. Doesn't uh, doesn't the ibis have a big nose? I mean, not not pelican like nose. No, ibis is eagle. Just, oh, the oh. ibis does have a bend. It has a bendy nose. If you look at the real ibis that i just googled it does have a bendy nose you're right but i would not not the pelican kind of you know the where he stored food in it like a pelican can gun to your head gun, if you had to pick you had to pick one bird <laughs> in the bird fight what bird you picking that's a good question hawk yeah hawk pretty that's an easy one you're right Eagle? We had a hog. We were standing. This is a good parenting moment. We're in the back. We're looking out the window of the backyard. And there's a baby, couple baby bunnies were, were there. And one day my wife is standing at the mirror, the window looking out. And she's just, oh, look at the baby bunny. And then she starts screaming because a hawk had come down and just taken one of the baby bunnies away. And we didn't tell the kids because the kids asked, where'd the bunnies go? Oh, they just hopped away. Yep, they went. They were, didn't tell them they were dinner for some hawk. It's amazing. Yes, good parenting. All right, let's move on. Let's finish up here. What else? Oh, we have we'd be we would really be remiss if we didn't offer our condolences to the family of Fred Gruninger. Rest in peace to the uh athletic director for a long time in Piscataway. Um I think this is the best way to put it. A significant person in Rutgers history. You know, that doesn't mean he is a perfect AD by any stretch. I think most people who were around Rutgers. Uh, in those days, you know, wondered if he if his leadership was part of what held it back. Obviously, a few of the big decisions he made, you know, in hindsight, just seem you know impossible to understand. Especially, you know, joining the Big East during um, the early days of that conference. Brian, I know you didn't cover him, but you know, just reading the retrospectives and, and knowing what you know about Rutgers, you know, what was your sense of 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 him? Seems like people really liked him as a person. He was a good guy, he built good relationships with people. He worked with, I think the word uh, complicated with his legacy has been thrown around a bit in just that he was at Rutgers at a crucial point where they were turning to big time athletics and he was there for a very critical decision on whether to be an original member of the Big East. He seems like he ultimately chose to go and create the Eastern Eight with Joe Paterno and Penn State. Penn State eventually bolted to the Big Ten. Rutgers was kind of left hanging high and dry. Uh, obviously not the right decision at the time. Hindsight's obviously 2020. I wasn't there in the moment. Obviously, I was not born yet to know to weigh the pros and cons. But I do know that that was a decision that you know, weighed heavy for Rutgers and Rutgers Athletics. Uh, you could argue maybe held the Rutgers Athletics back for a decade, right? Um, they had to climb back from what could have been. Um, but he was also, I believe he was a coach, like a golf coach at Rutgers, right? Uh, mm-hmm. He was an AD for 25 years. You're yeah, not an AD it's amazing. for 25 years for... for yeah. I mean, things times were different back then, but to be an AD right. for 25 years, have, have no scandal that I, we are aware of or that I've read about, uh, to be well-liked around the community, uh, I think is a, an achievement to the kind of guy he is. And uh, yeah, I never met Fred Gruninger, obviously, but uh, may he rest in peace and yeah. our condolences to his family. 
Yeah, I think part of that too is just that you have to remember the time, and it's not just one person. You know, a lot of reluctance to not just a lot of reluctance to Rutgers going big time athletics. It's, it's, it's still a struggle, right? I mean, think about what it was like in the eighties. There's people who thought they should be playing Lehigh and and Lafayette. That was they were the like, probably for a while the majority or close to it. You know, so it's not you can't take these things in a vacuum. The decisions that he made certainly uh, you would wonder what it would be different. How Rutgers might be different had they made different choices at diff- many different points. Uh, in the school's history, and, the, and those are just two two of the big ones. So, all right, good job, guys. I think we covered everything. Are we missed anything, Pat? We're wrestling here. I, I always wait to the very end. Yeah, uh, good win over Edinburgh. They were clearly the superior team. They Sharon, shared, they Sharon shared, Stone's uh, alma mater. What are you hearing about the road trip to Red- a good crowd at Edinburgh? Uh, no, it looked like a, a high school venue, uh, uh, but. Listen, they, they gotta you gotta wrestle these teams and fill the non-conference slate, and it is what it is. The next up is a, a huge match against Princeton and a rivalry a rivalry series Friday night. It's always juicy, so I think look forward to that. Uh, I know I am. So, uh, yeah, things start to pick up a little bit for wrestling over the next couple of weeks. So, should have more more coverage, more things to do, more things to talk about. So, looking forward to it. All right. And we will definitely be back uh, on Monday after a couple of battles with Brian's waving his hands frantically. Two what? things. Big ups to mm-hmm. Scott Goodell for traveling to Edinburgh. A road, true road game at Edinburgh. Not everybody does that. Shouts to uh, it's true. Coach, okay. Coach Goodell. Two, right. Rutgers women's basketball's game against Iowa in January. Officially Ooh, yeah. sold out. People are having Caitlin Clark mania. Um, people who I've never talked to about sports have asked me about Caitlin Clark coming to Rutgers. So obviously she has a strong effect. Uh, the ticket prices for that game are, are pretty high. Like ticket prices you would not expect for Rutgers women's basketball. Uh, and I think it'll be a fun day for a lot of women's basketball fans that will show up uh, who want to get a photo or a signature, an autograph from Caitlin, who seems to be very good with fans and appreciates her place as a historic player. Did you see the Rutgers women's basketball game at 11 a.m. on a Wednesday for the recess game? Could you imagine being like a third grader who got out of school to go to a Rutgers sporting event? That would be the best day ever. Wow. I didn't see that. Huh. And Rutgers won That's in emphatic idea, fashion. Whoever came up with that. Love yeah. it. Good idea. As a kid, we went to Newark Bears games. Our rest in peace, the Newark Bears, an institution in Newark mm-hmm. that's been yeah. gone for a few years. I went to, we went to like one or two when I was in grade school. Did you guys go anywhere, Pat, when you were in any field trips? No, too? no. You know, standard field trips. No sporting events, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. What about you, Pat? Nope, nope. The buses didn't. Uh, the buses didn't work like that back in the day. Back in my day, didn't go that far. No, that couldn't couldn't afford it. Five miles to the gallon. <laughs> the, the, the dune buggies with the horses in the front. Ah, there you go. That's what I was at. The stage coaches, uh, dune buggies with horses. All right, good job, guys. We'll be back on Monday. Or you know, I'm just going to throw this out here, a little teaser. There's a, there's a chance. A good chance that there might be another special edition of this podcast. How about that? Just leave that there. But if not, we'll see you on Monday. We'll talk some hoops. Thanks. Thank you for listening to the Rutgers Rant. To participate in the conversation and receive live updates about the Scarlet Knights directly to your phone, sign up at nj.com slash insider.